Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, aka the guy who's got those ho ho hoes, and this video we're breaking down the Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. The 40 minute entry is packed with easter eggs, a big twist, and lots of hidden details that set up Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. James Gunn has said that this is something you need to see before checking out the upcoming movie, and whether that's true or not, there are still some things here that will likely be picked up down the line. We're going to be theorising it all, and there will be heavy spoilers here, so if you haven't had a chance to check it out, then check out now. Hit the thumbs up button to spread that Christmas cheer, and make sure you subscribe to get gifts from my sack. Giveaway at the end of the video as usual, and with that out of the way, let's get into the breakdown. Okay, so the holiday special starts off with us hearing the song Fairy Tale of New York by the band The Pogues. The Marvel Studios logo then fades in, and we see several panels from Christmas themed comics. We see the Thing wearing a Santa's hat from his Christmas special, Thor flying up, and Doctor Strange turning a Venus flytrap into a Christmas tree. This is from the Christmas is Strange comic, and it's accompanied by the time Carol Danvers met Santa. In the story, she was captured by Grace Valentine and also Toxie Doxy, who'd kidnapped her along with a homeless man. They were carrying out human experiments, and Carol broke free to take them on. The homeless man was actually revealed to be Santa, and he aided Carol in taking down the bad guys. In the Marvel Universe, Santa is actually a mutant, which explains a lot, and this was confirmed further in this issue. Next we get a turkey and a storefront window, followed by the time that She-Hulk met Santa. She-Hulk was told she needed to find evidence in order to convict a killer, and she went to private investigator Nick St. Christopher, which is the name Santa was going under. Next we get is what I believe the cover of Hulk issue 378. Hulk looks green here, whereas that he's greyer than a Christmas day in England, however the jaw shape is exactly the same, as is the position of Santa. On top of this we also get a quick cut of X-Men Holiday Special 1, and this is accompanied by Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur issue 37. Devil Dinosaur, wait, you, you don't think. Now there's some other flashes before we pull out to the typical Marvel Studios character pop-ins, which are now covered in snowfall. Every time there's a new show or film, these always get updated, and She-Hulk has been added to the letter A. I think this is the first time she's appeared in the titles, as the one for Wakanda Forever was dedicated to Chadwick Boseman. She carries out a thunderclap, and we see that the Marvel Studios logo now has Christmas lights surrounding it. I love the way they've darkened parts of the red to give it a real nighttime feel, and the shadows and lighter bits reflecting the kind of lights that a Christmas tree gives off. From here we cut to the Eclector, aka Yondu's ship. Used by the Ravagers, this became a home for Peter when he was younger, and along with Kraglin, he held a Terran Christmas. These flashback scenes are animated to look like a 70s and 80s cartoon, and by the looks of it, they're using a technique called rotoscoping. This involved the scenes actually being filmed for real using actors, and then animators would trace over the top of them. It helped give a more fluid style of animation to the characters, and because of this, they move more like real people would than if they'd been drawn. Wyatt Earl played the young Quill in the Guardians movie, but here he's voiced by Luke Klein. I love how the star on the tree is basically an alarm light, and we see that Yondu doesn't take too kindly to handouts and gifts. He thinks Christmas is mushy, and that sentimentality will get you killed out in space. He says that if they don't get rid of the tree, then they'll be cleaning the latrine for a year, and Kraglin says, But that's Jeff's favourite job! You talking back now, Kraglin? Jeff is someone you'll recognise from Guardians 2, and dear me, what a disgusting hobby you have. Now Yondu smashes the tree like it's a like button, and we learn that Kraglin is telling this story. He says, And that's how Yondu ruined Christmas which I think might be a play on the title How the Grinch Stole Christmas. He also brings up the multi-calendar, which is something that I don't think we've heard about before. He says it's almost Christmas time on Earth, so my guess is that it works like a calendar across multiple planets. See, I figured it out, you, you wouldn't get that on another breakdown. Now a year on Earth is of course a different length to a year on another planet, so they would need something like that to keep this all in check. As of making this video, which is Wednesday morning, because we get it sent early and Kevin Feige has you blocked. See you, chump. The timeline is a bit unclear. Hawkeye and the End of No Way Home both took place during the same week of Christmas, and it's possible that this is a similar situation too, with it happening roughly around those events. However, it could be Christmas of the following year, but let me know below if they've come out and specified when this is. Anyway, here we find the team on Nowhere and learn that the group bought it from the collector. This was announced in the build-up to the project, and you can even see the eye hole in the top left corner giving away the location. 
The collector loves rare and mysterious gifts, and I love the idea that he'd collect a celestial head and then use it as his home. This would mean he's surrounded in his own collection, and it's a really nice touch. Now, this was destroyed in Infinity War, and the collector's home was blown up before that in Guardians of the Galaxy. That freed Cosmo the space dog, who appeared at the end in the post credit scene. Having his home and nowhere destroyed clearly made the collector up sticks, and we actually saw his ship at the start of the Loki finale. As we travel through space, it flew past the camera, showing that he's out there somewhere, we just don't know where. Hey, don't know where! Thanks, I'm here all week. Now, the Guardians are fixing it up to make the place livable once more, and Nebula agrees that hashtag Yondu was right. They don't have time for frivolous things like Christmas at this point, and we get a little joke from Drax. <laughs> I like the part where Yondu kicked over the tree. <laughs> <laughs> Guys nipples must have hardened over the airs, as you of course used to complain about how sensitive they were. Why aren't you wearing one of Rocket's arrow rigs? It hurts. I have sensitive nipples. Anyway, back on the ground, we see Cosmo levitating panels. In real life, space dogs were used by the Soviets in the 50s and 60s to see if it was possible for life to travel in space. On November 3rd, 1957, Sputnik 2 was launched, and on board was the dog Laika. She became the first animal to orbit the Earth, but sadly she died within 5-7 to seven hours of the flight from overheating. The actual cause of death wasn't made public until 2002, with officials saying beforehand that she died due to lack of oxygen. In 1998, Oleg Gazenko expressed remorse saying that he didn't learn enough from the mission to justify Laika's death. The Soviets actually launched several of these missions into space, and unlike Laika, most of the dogs did return. Cosmo pulls from the comics, and in those the dog has telekinetic abilities, which we see being demonstrated here. Voiced by Maria Bakalova, you might recognise her voice for playing Borat's daughter, back all over Borat 2. F***ing hell anyway. Nice little scene with Rocket, and another Earth animal interacting. Well I say Earth animal, we don't know fully what's going on with Rocket, but rumours surrounding Guardians 3 have said that we will see his backstory in the film. He was of course taken and experimented on, and this will be by the High Evolutionary who was unveiled to the public at Comic Con. The teaser trailer was shown there too, and though we can't play it here, Young Rocket was shown in it, so maybe he discovers his past with Cosmo. Both were experimented on, and I'm expecting them to realise they've got a lot of things in common the next time we see them. Peter walks around, and he meets Rhett Miller, a guitarist who writes a song about Christmas without knowing what it's actually about. This band is actually the old 97s, and we can even see the band member Murray Hammond wearing his classic glasses. This starts off a Christmas jig, with us getting the classic sort of title style that comes with Christmas specials. We also see Groot, who's grown up a lot since we last saw him. He was a teen, but now he's bulked up, and he's a bit of a meathead. Also, you can see a head symbol on Peter's t-shirt, which is also on a stand by the side. Guessing this represents nowhere and the newfound culture that's there, but let me know below if you think it has a different meaning. But the song bombs pretty bad, with it talking about how Mrs. Claus works the pole, and how the elves will rise up and stab out Santa's eyes. I quite like the song mind, and Christmas specials in general are of course littered with songs like this. John Bon Jovi even wrote a Star Wars themed Christmas album with songs like R2D2 We Wish You a Merry Christmas, and lots of sh** like that. Now at this point, we get a big reveal by Mantis. I feel like I should do something. Why? Because of, you know... That you ate the entire bowl of Zognuts in the commissary? My other secret. That you're cool sister? So Zognuts are what drags say when trying to remain invisible, but beyond that, Mantis being Peter's sister is a pretty big deal. I had to talk about the Zognuts first though. Now as we know from Guardians 2, Ego had a lot of children, and thus this makes Mantis his half-sister. There was actually a lot of things floating around in the lead up to and aftermath of Guardians 2 that actually spoiled this twist. In 2017, actress Jennifer Sharp posted out a picture of her working with Kurt Russell whilst she was wearing a Mantis costume. This is because she was actually playing her mother, foreshadowing this reveal. Jennifer's scene was cut from the movie, but there were remnants of it left behind when Ego walks Peter through his true plan. Amongst all the people he had kids with, we can see at the back Mantis's mother and Ego are stood there, setting up this reveal a while back. I've always thought the Ego thing in the second movie was similar to the reveal with Darth Vader and Empire, and Leia was of course revealed to be Luke's sister in Return of the Jedi, so it's sort of like poetry they rhyme with, with Mantis. Now they decide to travel to Earth to kidnap Kevin Bacon, who Quill is of course completely obsessed with. 
He brought up the legend of Footloose to Gamora in Guardians 1 and used a dance off as the way to defeat Ronan. In Infinity War, he asked if Footloose was still the greatest movie ever and he's looked up to Bacon since he was a kid. Now at this point we see Drax and Mantis travelling out in a new ship. This wasn't in Thor Love and Thunder, so my guess is that they picked it up from nowhere. Has lots of seats for them, so who knows what's going on. Guardians 3 was meant to release before Thor, so maybe they had something mess up in production, but that's highly unlikely as they were still in the scripting process. Now we watch as they travel through a hex point, and these have of course appeared in several other MCU movies as ways for characters to quickly travel across space. Now over at our merch website we're having a big Black Friday sale where you can buy any heavy spoilers item and get an additional 25% off something else. In case you don't know, I made this company with Real Rejects and Screen Crush to bring you a nerdy way to support our channels and also get some sick merchandise out of it. We've taken a lot of time to make sure the material on the shirts and hat are top quality and have a ton of different designs. We've just launched this size matters Ant-Man one and you can get some stuff for House of the Dragon, see your chump and even a theory time. Two time, two time. One. Link to that will be in the description and I really appreciate the support. Thanks. Anyway, back to the special, we get a quick scene with Kevin Bacon, who's listening to Dead by Christmas by Hanoi Rocks. We watch his Drantis jump across multiple hex points and also get another niche song. James Gunn is flexing his full musical knowledge here, and while some specials would just go with the more cliche hits, he uses I Wish It Was Christmas by Julian Casablancas. This is actually a cover song, and you might recognise the original from SNL. Also, nice to see Mantis flying, might come up in the next film, but just something that, that might also be a throwaway. Now they talk about how Quill has hyped Kevin Bacon up, and to them, he must be the leader of all people on Earth due to all the stories Peter told. I love how there's a woman panicking as she sees the ship roll in, and after all the stuff that people in the MCU have gone through, you can totally see why they'd have this reaction. Drax has forgot to put on the cloaking device, but he turns it on and the pair land at the Hollywood sign before they head up LA. In the background we can also hear the song Is This Christmas by the band The Wombats. They go to the Chinese theatre, which has popped up in the MCU before. During Iron Man 3, this is where an extremist explosion went off and it put Happy in hospital. It's a far more happy occasion for the happy holidays though, and we watch as they go on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The public seem unaware of who Drax and Mantis are, but they had people cosplaying as them at Avengers Con and Ms. Marvel, so what the hell's going on Kevin? What the f bro? Can't even keep stupid pedantic details like this consistent across 36 f***ing films and shows, the f***? Anyway, we see someone dressed as Zorro, Jack Sparrow, and also someone as Psykill from the Transformers. Drax ends up beating this guy up as Mantis says that Gobots killed his cousin. Gobots exist in the Transformers universe, and does, and does this mean? It's, it's all connected. But there's also some of the Avengers 2, along with Ant-Man, Captain Marvel, and Captain America. There's Black Widow 2, and in the background we can see a movie poster for Kingo. If you cast your mind back to the Eternals, then you'll probably remember he had a full spy film franchise, making him basically a Bollywood Bond. This is what we see here too, with a poster advertising a spy adventure for him. Later on we catch another bit of promo for the character, only this time it's advertising a Christmas movie. Kingo of course had an apparent acting dynasty, even though it was just him pretending to be his own son, so that he could live forever without drawing too much suspicion. There's also a living statue, and if you look above him, you'll see a poster for Haxon 3. Haxon 2 was actually a movie in the Marvel Universe that was starring Simon Williams. He was played by Nathan Fillion, but unfortunately, Kingo ended up replacing Simon from Haxon 3 onwards. A family take a photo with them, and we hear... With the God of War. Drax is of course bald and he has red marks on his face, making him look similar to Kratos. God of War Ragnarok is a game in which you fight Thor, and Thor Ragnarok showed that it's all connected like I've been saying, been f***ing saying it for months now. Now they take photos with several people, and it's very similar to the selfie scene that happened in Ms. Marvel. At one point we can actually also see the arm of Thor behind Drax as he takes a pic with a hen potty. Next there's a guy in elf ears who we see taking photos with them in Captain Marvel. He's got ears like that and is still taking the photo, so I'm thinking that he might even be an elf from New Asgard. They obviously have vacations on Earth, and we had a light elf in Runa who too travelled out to LA in She-Hulk. Drax's face is hilarious throughout, with him just standing there looking completely expressionless as people pine around him. They clean up money wise and then head to the bar Yavos. This is a possible reference to Yavo, who directed the Inferno music video for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. 
Here the bartender is played by Fleur Borg, who also worked with Gun on Suicide Squad. He played the character Javelin, and we get some other cameos when we get the star maps that Mantis takes after she robs someone. Legit, like, robbed all their money. And this includes Margot Robbie and also John Cena, who too work with Gun on Suicide Squad. Or is it The Suicide Squad? Can't remember. Bit stupid calling the two movies the same thing, but basically moving on. There's also Queen Latifah, Arnie, someone, got no idea who that is. We're at Kevin Spoiler's office, we, we thought it might be Zach from Saved by the Bell, but let me know below if you know who it is. Lastly, we go to Kevin Bacon's, and in a little bit of meta commentary, we see that he's watching the 1964 film Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. This was about Santa meeting aliens, much like what's going on here. When they enter the house, we also hear the song I Want an Alien for Christmas by Fountains of Wayne. They of course sang the song Ryan's Mom Has Got It Going On, and it too ties in with the aliens chasing Bacon through the house. Now, I know it's Stacy's mom, but it's a crap joke, I'm sorry. Now Bacon's house number is 1988, which is the same year that Quill was kidnapped, and it's also the year that I was born. Drax throws Mantis over the gate, and they knock on the door directly. Also, Bacon has a guitar in his living room, which sort of sets up the end. Bacon goes on the run, and we watch Mantis jump through the house after him, similar to how a praying Mantis moves. Bacon makes it to the street, where the police show up. This is the first time I've seen the pigs protecting Bacon, and we actually get some similar music to Danny Elfman's Batman Returns score. The police shoot up Drax, but it just tickles. Mantis puts the officers to sleep, and this is a similar move to what she carried out on Ego in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. They mess the police up as badly as Riri Williams did, and Mantis uses her powers to make Bacon want to go with them. They ask about the Fonz, who Quill has also told them about, and mention Kevin's character in Friday the 13th. Quill said that he killed Jason Voorhees, but in reality he was killed by Jason's mother Pamela, who stabbed him through the neck with an arrow. Slowly they come to realise that Kevin Bacon is actually an actor, which as we all know, sucks. Worst people of all time, after influencers, and of course YouTubers. Now I'm kind of wondering how Kevin Bacon being in the MCU works, because he played Sebastian Shaw in X-Men First Class. X-Men First Class had a young Professor X, and Professor X popped up in Multiverse of Madness. Wolverine and Deadpool are coming in too, so maybe this is like a Ralph Boner situation where they're different people with the same face in different universes. I don't know, sh sh shut up for a second, because they also mentioned this. Hello, I'm the Batman. I mean, I'm the, hello, I'm Bruce Wayne. Who is Bruce Wayne? Now, Batman and Bruce Wayne are both mentioned, coupling this with the Eternals, in which there was also a name drop alongside Superman. I think that in the MCU, DC Comics might be the comics that they read, and this is why they're superheroes in their own pop culture. Back in Nowhere, we see Peter in a bar by himself, and he's lured outside by Groot, who along with the others has thrown a surprise party. Nowhere lights up, covered in Christmas lights, and we also hear the song Christmas Time Has Come by the Smashing Pumpkins. Fake snow is created to make it feel like a tarrant Christmas, and everyone there is wearing Christmas jumpers. I love how Draxus has a cat shooting lasers out of his eyes, and they sort of create a Times Square and have a big concert there. Bacon is put in a box like a supermarket... And, he, and he's unveiled like a stripper in a cake. Mantis lifts her control, and Bacon makes a mad dash for it, which ends in Kraglin taking him to the ship. He says, what, what, What's that on your head? Uh, that is a device for controlling a flying arrow. I ain't quite got the hang of it yet. At the end of Guardians 2, he saw him practicing, trying to make Yondu's fly. Seems like he hasn't got the hang of it yet, and I also wonder what happened to his wife. Love and Thunder had him coming off the back of getting hitched, and he might have just humped and dumped like the genius he is. He also talks about how the hero that inspired the hero that is Peter Quill is Kevin Bacon. Kevin gets a call from his wife, and he got reception out there because he's been using EE, the UK's number one network. He could go home, but in the end he decides to stay and teach people about Christmas. This leads into Bacon singing a song whilst the gifts are given out. Groot gets a Game Boy. This actually took me back to my own Christmases as a kid. Rocket gets given Bucky's arm, and he of course wanted to back an Infinity War and even asked him about it. No idea what my man is doing now, or, or how Nebula even got this, but let's just not ask any questions. Cosmo brings Kraglin a dead animal, which is a nice way to show they have a bond, and I forgot to mention earlier that the dog is probably using a universal translator, which is how it can talk. 
Mantis gives Drax an elf, and this ties back to him wanting to go back to Bacon's house to get the one he took. Similar sort of style, and we see that Groot has created wooden dioramas retelling the special. There's the group standing on the balcony, chasing Bacon, and flipping the cop car over, along with Bacon in the box. Lastly is Kraglin, holding his own Kraglin, who just so happens to be holding his own Kraglin. Finally, the people of nowhere understand Christmas, and there's a lot of similarities here to Nightmare Before Christmas. That was all about the people of Halloween Town learning what Christmas was all about, much in the same vein of what this special is too. Lastly, Mantis reveals that she's Quill's sister, which is the best Christmas gift of all. The man who lost his mother and realised his father was a f***ing dead, now has someone who's part of his actual family, and it's such a nice little tale. Peter also tells Mantis how the Yondu story actually ended, and we see him digging his own present out of the trash. Here he has a little figure, which actually showed up in Guardians Volume 2, alongside the others in his collection. Volume 1 also showed him getting a little troll from Peter, as a little troll, and we now understand why it meant so much to him. We also see a present for the Taser Face, <laughs> and uh, Quill is given his iconic guns by Yondu. These are called Quad Blasters and Element Guns in the comics, which is something that the character has brandished in both. The pair ride off into the skies together, and they write Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to all. From here we get the credits, which are in red and green, to hammer home that holiday wholeness. The credit scene has Groot as a tree, but he can't keep his arms up, and because he ruined Christmas, they're gonna have to have another special. Not sure if that's gonna happen though, as Gunn is now over at DC running things, so it is kind of unlikely for the foreseeable future that he's gonna go back to Marvel. Maybe they'll have another character getting a special though, which will tie in with the holiday next year. So that ends the special, and what a load of f***ing shit that was. I'm just kidding, I actually had a lot of fun with it, and though I, I doubt I'm going to watch it again, this was a nice little trip back to the MCU in the vein of classic Hollywood specials. It's always nice being back with the Guardians, and both Drax and Mantis are absolutely hilarious, with Dave Bautista especially making me laugh out loud a couple of times. <laughs> The whole inclusion of Kevin Bacon was great too, and I love the thing being built around his appearance. Six Degrees of Separation just got a lot easier due to the MCU, and the songs added a nice touch to it. I probably won't remember it this time tomorrow, but it was a nice bit of content for the holiday to just keep us chugging along until the next thing. I do kind of feel like all the projects the MCU are doing now have really oversaturated the brand, and it'll be interesting to see what viewership for this is like. I don't think it's necessary to see Volume 3, and it's just another stopgap to see what characters are doing, rather than to see where the story is going. So yeah, fun little thing to watch in the morning, with some nice little easter eggs in it. Beyond that though, not that deep, but you know, it's a, it's a holiday special, so you're just going to get songs, you're going to get some laughs, and just some things to, to keep you watching for the 40 minutes that it's on. Anyway, so great glowing review there, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you're watching this James Gunn, I did enjoy it. You know, I'm just gonna say the positives and negatives. I'm trying to be balanced, and uh, I'm, I'm a still I'm still a shill though. And because of that, I'd love to hear your thoughts, shill as well. And uh, also let us know if there's anything we missed. Did it ruin Christmas? Was it okay? Or did it make that holiday special? Thank you. We're running a competition right now and giving away three copies of House of the Dragon season one on the 15th of December, just in time for Christmas. And all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video. Make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the special. We pick the comments out random on the 15th, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, we've got a breakdown of the Andor finale on screen right now, so definitely go head over there right after this. Without the way, thanks for sticking through the video, I've been Paul, you take care yourself, and I'll see you next time. Peace.